Hello, my name is Jessie Marion Davis and I'm joined by Jane Mitchell, Creative Director and Principal Flute at Aurora Orchestra. This Sunday we launch Aurora Play, where we'll be streaming uh, live performances uh, by the orchestra and we're kicking off this Sunday with Hector Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique from the proms last summer. Um, you can visit auroraorchestra.com for details of how to watch and join in with what we're doing. But I've got some questions for Jane and I'd like to kick off with um, your role at Aurora, Aurora Orchestra, which is a little bit unusual in that it goes beyond principal flute. On top of that, you are creative director. Tell us a bit more about what that role involves. Creative director is a role that involves many things. It's mostly about programming, so putting together what we do on the concert platform, and especially what we call our orchestral theatre series, which is where we collaborate with other art forms, use concerts to perhaps tell stories, put things together in interesting ways. So the role itself might involve writing a script or researching a particular piece or a composer. Um, it involves a lot of just trying to come up with ideas and then collaborating with a lot of other artists, so lighting directors, designers, movement directors, other directors, and a lot of the role actually is about thinking about players and what they can do, and it's so useful to be a player myself at, at that point, because I I have that knowledge of what is possible and what's not possible. And you use this term, this phrase, orchestral theatre, um, and thinking now about your the production of Symphonie Fantastique that Aurora performed at the proms, uh, last summer. Could you tell us a bit how, how orchestral theatre might have influenced that performance? What might we be looking out for on Sunday? So orchestral theatre involves many things. It is this idea of putting music at the very centre of what's on stage, but then looking at ways you can draw out other things about the music. So it might be context, it might be uh, the notes themselves and trying to get an audience to understand something like harmony or texture or dynamics or instrumentation by moving the players around, using lighting, thinking about what the players wear. It might be working with designers and movement directors to just just try and bring out some of those things. And the Berlioz was a real gift for this because it is a symphony that tells a story. So of course, there was a lot that you could play with and bring out. And the, the way that props and lighting and indeed Berlioz's own words from his memoirs were used uh, was fantastically effective from an audience point of view. How was it for you, Jane, when you finally took to the stage and, and performed the work on the night? How did it feel? It was a very, very intense experience. There was so much going on because it was one thing is that we were performing it from memory, which always brings its own intensity. And so there was all that kind of precise, you've got you've got to just perform in the moment and get it right and recall everything perfectly and stay calm, but also stay focused and all those things that are just innate to performing. But for me also, it was the culmination of a two year journey um, of trying, of just taking that brief of go and do something with Symphonie Fantastique and figuring out what that would be. And then the huge process of figuring out what can work and the Royal Albert Hall is an amazing space, but it's quite a tricky space because you have uh, the mix of people very, very far away who can see tiny people on the stage. And then we also had TV cameras up close. So the whole design of the project had to, had to take into account that very close, intimate feel and the very big space of the hall. So there was, what I'm trying to say is there were so many kind of impossible seeming tasks along the way. So to stand there and perform it at the end felt, it was, it was kind of overwhelming actually that it was even happening. Could you name me a couple of things that, that, that the players had to do or were asked to do as part of the orchestral theatre of this production that, that were perhaps quite unusual? I'd say there were, there were lots of things towards the end of the piece. We kind of it kind of builds in 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 what it asks of players really. But the last movement, we did ask them all to wear masks, um, which which actually within when the idea presented itself uh, many months before, I thought there's there's absolutely no way that will happen. If you think about the players, you think about asking a, a tuba player and how they're going to be able to breathe and hold the instrument, and then a violinist and making sure the bow is not going to hit part of the mask let alone how they're gonna put them on, on stage with everyone seeing, how wind players are gonna be able to breathe. So our brilliant designer, Kate, um, had to talk to every single player and create a bespoke mask that they were happy with. And then there was the whole question of, can you hear each other? Which we weren't able to tell until, until very close to the time when we were all together in the rehearsal room. Um, and 
yeah, it was it was an absolute unknown, but it you'll see it happened. <laughs> it happened and it just I it does look absolutely amazing and I think the players the players they did find it really hard but they would say it was worth it. But yeah, definitely definitely those moments in the fourth and fifth movement you'll see um were not without their challenges. And you've got your flute with you, no doubt. Can we trouble you for an an excerpt from the piece? A real personal favourite moment for me is the opening of the third movement, um, which is set at night time in the countryside. And in our production, you'll see we um, there's a giant moon behind the orchestra and the lights are turned low, which of course you can do if you're asking your orchestra to memorise because they don't need to see their music. Um, and the, um, the players all have tiny lights on their wrists to represent fireflies, which of course then move as the players move and um, so it looks it was a really beautiful moment um and it's lucky for the flute because Berlioz gives the very opening tune to the flute and the violins um and it's this kind of endless melody that is so calm and so beautiful um I won't play the whole thing because as I say it is it is kind of endless um but I'll just play the very opening Thank you so much Jane. Um, in terms of memorising and while you still have your flute to hand, were there any other sort of passages or moments that you could show us on the flute that um, that were particularly demanding to, to, to remember, to commit to memory? Oh there were so many and um, it's now a good seven months ago so this is this is a challenge in itself but there is there's one passage and I think a lot of the wind players would say the same in the last movement and it's over in an in a flash but it's so difficult because it's got, you'll hear, I'm gonna play it, I'm gonna, if I can remember it, I'll play it. Um, it's got, every interval is, feels completely random and there's no melody and, and it's technically quite difficult. So I'm gonna just have a go, I haven't done this for a long time. Um, hopefully it's just in the muscles. <laughs> It's just that it's over before you know it. That was it. But um, but honestly, that took that just took so long to memorize because there's no there's no pattern. There's nothing you can do. You just have to stare at the notes. What do you love about performing at the proms? Oh, performing at the proms is an absolutely unique experience. I have to say, just the the scale of it is so incredible. I always I always quite it always makes me slightly want to cry looking out there and just knowing that all those people are there because they love orchestral music. Um and as musicians, uh, actually, you don't get that many thousand people sharing that so often. And there's a there's a sort of special love in the proms. I think there's a real intensity about it. Um, you know that people just care so deeply about the music, and sharing that I think is what feels so special. And I know musicians from all over the world who play in all the big concert halls. Um, there's always a special place in their hearts for a proms performance. The disco ball. I mean, that must be highlight for you. Is that your first experience interacting with a disco ball in orchestral form? I have to say, a disco ball. It turns out is a is a asset to any orchestra, and it's it's not the first time. Um, it is something we have used before um, because they're just so good, but never on this scale. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you.